turn your Bibles to the second chapter of Luke. Uh, I want to read from the 13th verse. We're going to one verse this morning. We're going to learn some things, maybe, uh, that we did not know. In the 13th verse, the second chapter of Luke, and said that there was with them an angel, an angel multitude of the heavenly host, uh, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We're going to touch that in a minute. We're, first of all, I want to say, 25th of December is not Jesus' birthday. No man really knows what it is. This is time that's set apart that we worship Christ and his birth. Now, when I was probably about 10, 11, 12 years old, we passed through Barlow, and we saw on the bank building, Xmas. And that's the first time I encountered it. X means nothing must. Is we're going to find out what that means. When you find the word Christmas, it's divided in two segments, and the first word is what? Christ. 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 Now, why do we call Christmas Christmas when it spells Christ? Have you ever thought about that? So it ought to be Christmas. Now, without Christ, if it's an X, we have must. Can you tell me what that means? Well, it's a derivative of the Catholic word that means what? Mass. Mass. Now, what does mass mean? For the word of services. Worship. Worship. Worship, praise, honor, and glory. Now, if you take Christ out of Christmas, you have mass, which means praise, honor, and glory. What are we going to praise? Christ. <laughs> now, if, if X is in the place of Christ, what are you going to worship? Number 10. Nothing. 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 So it means nothing. Now, I have about three or four things to say before we open up the word. We've all said, what did you give me for Christmas? Yeah. Everybody said, where's the hat? What'd you give me for Christmas? Next thing, how much did you pay for? Now those are two, two very important things. I can remember us going to my grandmother's, uh, my daddy's mother, on Christmas. Early and I, we were little. Sitting in the back seat, we turned down the lane. She lived up on a hill. We could see the old white house. And my sister said to me, I wonder what Mammy got us. This Christmas, probably a pencil. <laughs> and that's what she got us, was a pencil. Well, to us as kids, that wasn't very good gift for us, no. a pencil. That's cool. But that's all she could afford. Couldn't afford anything else. Then you could get a soft lead and a hard lead. How much did a pencil cost? Two for a nickel. Penny. One penny. Yeah. One penny. That's all she could afford. And I can remember this, and I've always had this in my heart. I never said anything about the gift that anybody gave me. Even if I didn't like it, I would thank them very much for it because they gave that with love. They gave it with integrity. They gave it with, with all the strength that they had. It might not be what I wanted, but it's what I got. So I'm thankful for that. So we want to know what you give me, how much it costs. And it comes to the fact now of what did God give me for Christmas. Now if Christmas means Christ, if it means praise, worship, honor, and glory, then what did God get me for Christmas, which is the real meaning for Christmas, that we worship God because he came in a fleshly body, he came to this earth, for us. So what did you get me, God? It's not the amount of it, but it's the cost of it. He gave his only begotten. 
begotten Son. Didn't have two, didn't have three, four. He gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in them should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, Christmas presents ought to be received, and they're to be received with thanksgiving. Thank you for your presence. I love you because you're you and you love me enough to give me something. So it tells us of the love of God and how much he loved us. He gave his son in order to save us. So Christmas must have Christ and Christ must have worship and praise. Now if you didn't know that before, you can go away, you know the meaning of Christmas and what it's all about. And I promise you, it is not a holiday, but it is a holy day. It has been changed into to commercialism. How many of you been shopping yet? How many of you going shopping? How many of you expecting a gift for Christmas? I'm not getting Barbara anything. She's got me. She's not getting me anything. I've got her. But we're getting our daughter and our grandkids something. I don't know what. It might be a sugar cane. But they're going to get something because we love them. <coughs> Why do we exchange gifts on Christmas? It's because they gave gifts unto the Christ child. Now, why do we have lights on the Christmas tree? Man, y'all are educated. <laughs> Talk to me. Why? We do things we don't even know why we do. Put them on there because Kate does it. It's like tradition. <coughs> tradition. <coughs> we don't even know why we do what we do. We just do it because it's always been done. Right? Right. It's not the message, the introduction. Introduction. Martin Luther, Martin Luther was the first one to put lights on a Christmas tree. I would ask you who Martin Luther is, but I know every one of you know. <laughs> and from there, lights begin to, he was a preacher, he's the one that introduced us to the glorious gospel in, in our modern times. And he was showing that Christ was the light of the world. So now you know about Christmas. You know about worship. You know about the gift of God. You know about the lights. And you know where it all came from. So don't worry about what you're going to get. You've already offered the greatest gift of all. Be concerned about what it costs. Because God paid the price on the cross. To give us the gift of eternal life. Amen. All right. Now in the second chapter of Luke, it talks about the birth of Christ and about he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Now after and while his birth was taking place, then it says that there were shepherds abiding in the field. They were watching over their flocks, caring for them. And there was a light that shined all around them. Now what was that light? Sun? Moon? The glory. The glory of God. When we stand in His presence, we stand in all His magnificent glory. And it said that these shepherds, they were so afraid. Why? Because it said that the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord spoken to them. And this is in the ninth uh, verse, eighth, uh, tenth verse. And he said, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. It included every living soul that would ever live on the face of this earth. So he bringing good tidings of great joy to all people. What tidings? He said unto you. Starts with a Y. You. You unto 
you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior. Now tell me what Christ means. <coughs> we're getting education, aren't we? This is a strange Christmas message. What does Christ mean? Savior. Savior. Redeemer. Redeemer. Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Lord. Lord. Messiah. Messiah. King. Well, we get, those are good. Those are good. We're looking at what Christ means. Christ is more than a swear word. He is a holy Savior sacrificed for the sins of the world. And he told the angel told the <coughs> shepherds that in Bethlehem it would be a sign for them. Not only for them, but for us. It's born this day in the city of David. You'll find him wrapped in swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes is burial. Burial clothes. It's not a blanket. It's burial clothes. So when Jesus was born, he was born to go to Calvary and give his life for the sins of the world. Good stuff? Good yes. right. stuff. Amen. Then it said, and suddenly, now when the angel of the Lord spake unto them and revealed unto them these good things, the Bible said, and Suddenly, that means without hesitancy, without any delay, as soon as the angel of the Lord spake these things unto them, there was a multitude, when he spake, a multitude, a multitude of what? Amen. Heavenly host, what was that multitude? Amen. Angels of the Lord. Now, notice, God is, has a message, and God delivers a message by the angel of the Lord from the throne of God, and when that angel delivered the message, suddenly there was a great multitude, the heavenly host. Now, the great multitude can mean a crowd, it can be a hundred, be a thousand, be a million. We don't know. But the glory of God shining right around them, the angels spake, and a multitude of the heavenly host. What were they doing? It said that they were praising God. Praising God. They were from the throne of God, in which they always praised God. And the shepherds in the field were able to have a message from God by an angel from God and hear the praise of the angels which was before the throne of God. Now, boy, that's eye revealing. That's eye opening. That's heart revealing. And saying, now, Hebrew, they weren't saying it in English. They were saying it in Hebrew. Hebrew. Why? Because they were Hebrews and the shepherds heard in Hebrew. <coughs> now we often think when we get to heaven everybody's going to speak English. <laughs> Do you know everybody spoke the same language until the Tower of Babel? We'll all speak the same language. Now, I don't know whether it be Hebrew. have no earthly idea what language we'll speak. But it'll all be the same language. I assume that it will be Hebrew. Can't prove it. Don't know what it is. And they were saying, first word, glory. There's often times in church since I've been a Christian man my heart gets turned to touch by the preaching, by the singing, by the playing. And all at once you might hear me holler out and you probably have heard me holler out, Glory! Glory to God! Now glory has three word to meaning. It means <coughs> praise, it means honor, and it means fame. You're the most famous that I've ever heard. You're the most honorable that I've 
I've ever stood before, and you're worthy of all the praise. So you might learn this word. When you hear something that thrills you, you hear something that moves you, you hear something that you give a grace to, jump up out of your seat and holler, Well, glory! Amen. I wouldn't do that for nothing because everybody would look at me. Well, when we stand in the presence of God, and it says when we cast our crowns before God, there will be some glory going on. Amen. There will be some praising going on. Why? Because He is worthy, worthy to receive thanks. Amen. Now, a messenger from God, not only a messenger from God, but a multitude standing along with the angels giving praise unto God and they were saying glory to God in the highest. Now what's the word highest mean? Hard to go up. Highmost. That's it. There's no object. There is nothing that we know that is higher than the highest. Amen. Nothing that we know. So they say, glory to God because you're higher and you're the highest of anything that we know. And then he said, and peace on earth. Now there are three aspects is we want to look at this morning. When it talks about peace, Peace on earth. In the New Testament, peace is used and it has three different meanings for it. Peace. Peace. I watched this morning on the news that we had two police officers shot to death in their car in New York City by a man that wanted revenge from Ferguson and New York. Put it on his face page, went out and shot him to death. They were on a break, sitting in their car. The marchers we've been watching march, no justice, no peace. I'm sure you've watched the news, haven't you? Yeah. The world's crying for peace. peace. Looking for Peace. I guarantee you there's some of you sitting here this morning that would like to have a little peace of mind. Amen. <laughs> I wish me and my husband got along because we need some peace. I wish my children weren't rebellious because we need peace. I wish my boss wasn't so angry with me. I need some peace on my job. So the whole world is looking for peace. So let me tell you something about peace. Turn to Matthew, the fifth chapter. We're going to take some time this morning. Tenth chapter. Won't you look at the 34th verse? Matthew 10 and 34. All of this world wants is peace. All I hear out of Washington is peace. All I hear from Washington is peace. Peace truth. Carrie, he all, spends all his time flying all over the world trying to get peace. They're marching in the streets of America wanting peace. Wanting peace. But this is what Christ said about peace. 34th verse. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. Man, that's an <coughs> eye-opening statement. Jesus said, don't you even comprehend? Don't you even stop? Don't you even think for a minute? Don't you even pray? Don't you even ask? Don't you even look forward to peace on this earth? I've not come for that. I have not come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a soul. All that means is he came to send division. Now think for a minute. When you get
get saved, you won't have to worry about the world separating itself from you if you live for God. I'll guarantee you they will flee from you. Amen. They don't want to be around you. Why? Because you're not the old man, you're not living the old way, and you're not doing the things that they do. So Christ said, I've not come to send peace. But yet he just got through saying in Luke 2, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. Now, do we have a contradiction? No. Now, tell me what those three pieces are. Won't you turn to Romans 5 1? Somebody read Romans 5 1. Whoever finds it first, let it be. Therefore, be justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, read it again. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. What brings peace? <coughs> faith. Faith in Christ brings peace. Now, that's peace with God. Peace with God. Now if you're not saved, you don't have peace with God. <clears throat> Instead of having peace with God, you have made Him your enemy. There will be no peace with God unless what? Two words. Starts with a C. First word and then J. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ! Boy, y'all are waiting. <laughs> Unless we've got Jesus Christ, there's no peace with God. That's why our world is turned upside down in our lives. That's why we don't get along with our wives, why we don't get along with our husbands, why we don't get along with our children, why we don't get along with our neighbors, why we don't get along with people at work. That's why we back back. That's why we have turmoil. That's why that all these things go on in our life. Because there is no peace with God. See, we were created in God's image. We were created to have fellowship with God. But until we're born again, there is no peace with God. No peace Amen. with God. When you turn your Bible to the book of Ephesians, Second chapter. <clears throat> Ephesians, second chapter. I'm going to start at the 14th verse. Here comes the second piece. First one was peace with God. Peace with God. Second one is the peace of God. Peace of God. For He is our peace who made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now there's something that keeps us separated from God. We can't have peace with God and we cannot have God's peace because there is a middle wall of <coughs> partition. What is that middle wall? It says it in the next verse. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make it himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Now the law was for one reason, is to let man know what sin was. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt have no other gods before me, so forth and so on. So it was revealing God's mind to men what God expected of men. But the law was a condemnation to man. All the law did was show man that there was something that separated them from God and that was S-I- Sin. In. 
Sin separated us from the presence of God. So he said there was a middle wall of partition. That he was abolished it. When did he abolish it? He abolished it on the cross. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the image thereof, and came and preached grace to you that were afar off and to them that were nigh. And, there, there, and through him we have, uh, we, we both have access to the Spirit unto the Father. Two things. He said it, that he preached, he preached, he taught to them that were far off. And he preached and he taught them that were near. Who's the near and who's the far apart? Who's the near? J. Jews. Jews! They were near to God. They were God's chosen people. But he also preached to them that were afar off. Who are they? Gentiles. That's the Gentiles. That's us. We were not God's chosen people. How did we get in this plan? He broke down the wall on Calvary because the rejected Jews, they rejected Christ as their Savior. We were brought into the family of God. Boy, that's good stuff. Amen. Amen. So suddenly there was a light that shone from heaven. And there was a multitude with the angel of the Lord. And they said, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Peace on earth. <clears throat> now that's the second piece. We found out from Romans 5, 1, he said, I've not come to send peace. He tells us in other scriptures, don't even pray for that. When he prayed for us, he didn't pray that we would have peace. Now when are we going to have peace on this earth? We're not. But there will be peace on this earth. You've got to remember, all through the New Testament, it teaches one thing. And the one thing is that Jesus Christ was the king of the Jews. Amen. And if he's the king of the Jews, then he must have a kingdom. All the way through the scriptures, the disciples ask him, will you restore at this time your kingdom? That's not what he came for. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He did not come to be king. He is never referred to as king of the church. He's always referred to as the head of the church. Amen. So if we have peace with God and that we have the peace of God, when will there be peace on this earth? <clears throat> now, here comes the good stuff. We're living in the moment of time that we're waiting and listening for the trumpet of God. Amen. It said, the voice and shout of the archangel and the trumpet of God would sound we which are dead we would rise, we would get our new glorified bodies, we would be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Grace ends, the church is taken out, grace ends. Now it begins the beginning of the great tribulation period. It will run for seven years. At the end of the great tribulation period, it said there was an angel that came down from heaven and he laid hold on the devil. He bound him in chains and he cast him in the bottomless pit and he would be bound there for a thousand years. Amen. Now if the devil's gone and if the devil's bound, can we have peace? Yes. But we're not going to be here. This is a time that the, uh, he will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem, set in the temple of God, and he will proclaim himself God. Now this is Jesus. And then he says that we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Now we, that's us. He said, because you may 
that have been faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. He says that some of you will be in charge of ten cities, some five, some one. It's according to our faithfulness here. If God cannot trust us now, what's he going to trust us with during the kingdom age? So there's going to be peace on this earth. We have peace with God. We have the peace of God. And there will be peace on this earth, but we will not be here in a physical, fleshly body during this period of time. Now he says, peace on earth and goodwill. Now what's this goodwill? Good is the highest. Good is the standard. Everything is good. Now, our word, the word good, comes from our word, God. Goodwill. God's will. Now, what's God's will for your life? What does he want for you? What do you expect from him? Now, this is our prayer. I'm a horse trader. How about you? Oh, girl, I've never fooled with horses in my life. You're lying. We're horse traders. Now, what do you do in horse trading? You swap something, most of the time a nag, for something better. This is what we say to God. God, if you will bless me, if you will get me out of this, I promise you, I'll quit doing this. Folks, there ain't no swapping with God. There ain't no trading off with God. With God, He is majesty. With God, He is the highest. With God, He is the rule setter. I've horse traded with God all my life. Yeah. Check this out. We want prayer before our ball games, don't we? This is what we pray. Oh God, let us beat them! <laughs> We have superstition in our ball game. My superstition was I'd be the last one when they blow the horn to start the game. I'd have to go shoot a layup. And if I made the layup, we'd win the game. <laughs> if you won on Friday night, you wore everything on Saturday night that you wore on Friday night. Even your drawers and your socks. <laughs> And then you made sure that you duplicated by time everything you did prior the night before. I did. And if you ever played sports, I bless God, most of you did. But God's not in the horse trading business. <coughs> he does not swap one thing for another. Our prayer is God's will. That's what he's saying. Peace on this earth and God's will be done. done. God's will. Now what's the will of God? That none should perish. Salvation. That's why he came. God's will be done. God's will. God's will. So peace on this earth. You're going to have peace with God, you've got to accept God's will. If you want to have the peace of God, you've got to accept God's will. There will be peace on this earth after the rapture, after the tribulation period, during the thousand years millennial reign with Christ. Now who does he say this peace it will be? He says to all men, to all men, what's the will of God? To all men. None of us are 
excluded. All of us are included. And every man has to come the same way. Boy, as a young Christian, I heard this, and I still hear it. There is a Baptist way, a Pentecostal way, and a Catholic way, and a Methodist way. Now, I can be in agreement with any denomination, no matter what their doctrine is, what their teaching is, if they teach this. You must be born again. No more. Right. That Jesus died, shed his blood, buried, resurrected for our sins. Amen. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. By grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If Amen. a church or a preacher believes that and preaches that, I can go along with it. Second thing, the only baptism that God set precedence of is the baptism by immersion. Amen. So if you get saved by grace, washed in the blood, you're saved. <clears throat> you're saved, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. But I do believe the Bible teaches just like when Philip preached to the eunuch, the eunuch said, what hindered me to be baptized? He wanted to be. But he said, you got to believe. He said, I believe. Philip said, whoa, in the chariot. They went down and he baptized him in the water. Amen. I was saved one Sunday at home. The next Sunday I walked the aisle, told everybody in the church I just got saved, and told the pastor, I want to be baptized. But... If I had not got baptized, and if I had died, I still am a child of God. Amen. So there's one thing that's essential to salvation, and that's by faith, by grace, plus nothing, minus nothing. Amen. So he said God's will to all men. So there's not a Baptist way. I don't believe in falling from grace. The Methodists do. If they, if they want to live a miserable life, let them go on. <laughs> the Pentecostal, they believe in falling from grace. I don't. They believe in speaking from tongues. I don't see it in that fashion. But if they want to, go on. I'm not going to fall out with them. I'm not going <coughs> to preach against them. I'm not going to bring condemnation to them. Why? Why? Because they got saved the same way I got saved, the same way that you got saved, and we're all going that when washed in the blood of the Lamb to the same place. Amen. Now, if the devil can get us to fuss and fight and disagree and argue about these things, boy, he has whipped us <laughs> and robbed us of our joy, right. robbed us of our peace, and the things that God wants us to have. Amen. Oh, Crow, that's good preaching. Amen. That is good stuff. Amen. Now listen. He said this was to all men. All men. Peace. I've made peace with God, and I got the peace of God. He said this peace of God passes all understanding. I can't understand that, but I accept it. I believe it. More than believe it, I know it. Besides knowing it, I have it. Amen. Besides having it, I've accepted it. Amen. And so I've got peace with God. I don't get up every morning and say, oh, I wonder what God's going to do to me today. <laughs> I remember this. <coughs> I was pastoring a church and we had some little old ladies in the church. Man, did they ever give me a bit. I never did do anything <coughs> right. And I had a horse to throw me. Been thrown many times. And hurt me. 
So I crept to the pulpit on Sunday morning, all bent over and crippled up because a horse had thrown me. One of the dear ladies after service, when she went out, she said to me, God's trying to tell you something. <laughs> God is trying to tell you. And I wondered, I'd been listening, and I wondered what he was trying to tell me. <laughs> Bless the Lord. The next week she was cooking, and she burned her hand good. I shouldn't have done <laughs> But I did. And I said to her, God is trying to tell you something. Amen. Have you ever thought and have you ever said to somebody, God is trying to tell you something. Because of an incident that happened in their life. Amen. Well, maybe he was, but it's not up to you to point it out. It's up to God to point it out and God to bring conviction on them. You ever do things like that? It jumps on me every once in a while. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. But you know what that is? That's being sharp tongue. <laughs> That's returning evil for evil. Boy, that is that's rough. Well Lord, I want to close with this. Ephesians, first chapter. This is a position there we're in, starting at the third verse. He says, blessed. Blessed. That means that you're going to get blessed. There is a blessing from God. Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and have blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ according to as he hath chosen us. Now, I like that. I never chose God. But God chose me. Amen. God chose you, convicted you of your sins, died on the cross that we might have an entrance into heaven. Amen. So God said that he blessed us in heavenly places according as he hath chosen us. Now, here's where he chose us. Before the foundation of the world. Now listen, this is indifferent. Do you believe in predestination? Yes, I do. I got your attention. <laughs> yep. I believe in predestination. Because if I didn't believe in predestination, I wouldn't believe the Bible. That's right. right. Oh, man. I don't believe in that predestination. You're talking about primitive Baptists. <laughs> See, primitive Baptists believe that you're predestinated from your mother's womb to go to heaven or hell. If you get saved, that would you were predestinated. I believe the Bible chief teaches us that we are free moral agents and we make the choice. Amen. God chose us. He opened the door. He said, whosoever will, let him come. It is our choice. Amen. But we need to understand about the predestination, predestined for the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love. <coughs> so him, he chose us before the foundation of the world. Now, who's us? We always want to take that as individuals. But remember, he died for the world. Church. Church. When he comes again, who is he coming for? The church. The church. He calls the church the what? The bride. He calls himself the bridegroom. So he predestinated us to be blameless without blemish, having predestinated us unto the adoption of the children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So it was the pleasure of God's will to break down the middle wall of perdition and to adopt us into the family of God. Now here's a good thing. I may have talked to you this before, but if you can get to hear it again, the word adoption has a very peculiar meaning that we're not familiar with. There may be some of you that adopt a child. Barbara and I down through the years have talked about adopting a child. We raised one girl 
Her name is Barbara Kay. She came to live with us when she was 14. We never did adopt her. Let me tell you, this has nothing to do with preaching. But I taught her all this time. Our girls were real little. I told her, I said, Barbara Kay, marriage is a sacred thing. And girls, women, when they get married, they wear white. Don't ever let that be a lie. Keep yourself and give yourself to your husband, the one you're married, but do not give yourself to every Tom, Dick, or Harry, or anyone that you have to be for. I did the ceremony. I did the preaching. Mile in Tennessee. Barbara Kay walked down that aisle. Boy, I tell you, I was so blessed. And when she stood before me, this is what she said. It is not a lie. Mm. It is not a lie. The white I wear is pure because I'm pure. The white I wear, I did not disgrace it. I did not disgrace my God. I did not disgrace my Savior. I did not disgrace my faith. She has cried. I was crying. It is not. Did it get out in your nest? <laughs> Men, it goes for you the same way. Same way. Amen. Amen. It is not a lie. We as parents ought to teach our kids that direction and that way. Sixth verse. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in his love. Now when it talks about adoption, the, the verse prior to that. Adoption means something different than it means in America. In the days of Christ, if a child was adopted, that means that the two that adopted him looked at him, saw him, examined him, and made a choice to make them the part of their family by adoption. In that day, if you adopted a child, you could never, never, never do anything to unadopt him. You could never cut him out of your will. That means what you own when you die, that <laughs> child has a part of it. Now, if somebody is born of your flesh, of your blood, of your bone, then you can write that person out of your will in the days of Christ. You could disown them, but by adoption you could never, never disown them. Now, what position does that put us in? I was born to this world. I was born to Jerome and Francis Crow. They could have written me off at any time. But when I got born again, God chose me. I chose Him. He adopted me in the family of God. And He can never unadopt me. He can never cut me out of His will. Amen. So I'm His. And He is mine. And I'm secure in that. Because I belong to him because he chose. He saw me. Dirty, rotten, filthy crow. <laughs> he said, I love you, buddy. I died for you. I know you ain't nothing, but I'm going to make you something. <coughs> Amen. Amen. I know your reputation, but I've got a new reputation. I'm going to give you my name. That's why we're called Christians. Christians. We are part of the family of God. We've been adopted in. There's not a one of us that was born of the flesh into the family of God. We've been born again of His. Starts with an S. Spirit. Spirit. God did not save our bodies, but He saved our. Starts with an S. Soul. Soul. Born of the Spirit of God. Saved our soul. Adopted into the family of God. Names written 
in the book of life, and now <coughs> we are his. Amen. And he is mine. Eight verse wherein he had abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Prudence means understanding. Having made known unto the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath proposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all <coughs> things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated. I told you I, I believe predestination. He predestined that Christ was going to come and become the Savior of the world. He predestinated that when he saved us that we would have an inheritance. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That we should be to the praise of his glory which first trusted in Christ. And whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of God, word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of his inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, under the praise of his glory. Now here it is. When God saved us, his Holy Spirit came in us. What the Holy Spirit does at that moment of time, it seals us. It seals us in the family of God. And it says we have an inheritance, an inheritance because we've been saved. He has sanctioned, he has sealed us into the family of God. Now what's this spirit for besides sealing us? Well, it says, that it's the earnest of our inheritance unto the day of redemption. Now we get saved, we get saved, we stand, we're the children of God. But this transaction of the soul being with the Lord is not complete. When will it be complete? It will be complete when He comes again, we get our new bodies, and we're Amen. But he sealed us. He said he gave us the earnest of his spirit. I've done this several times. I went and looked at property, went and looked at a house, and I said, how much? And I said, I'll take it. And they said, if you're going to take it, you're going to have to put something up front and put it down. I said, how much do you want? Well, I want 25%. And they, I said to them, I don't have 25%. And they said, you better get it or it's not yours. They wanted earnest money down. Now, this is what God did. When he saved us, he put his earnest blood down for us. And said, he is mine. I have taken him. He is mine. But my transaction will not be final until I come and get him. Receive him. Taking him out. Amen. Amen. You remember in the book of Luke, I think it is, about the good Samaritan. He found the man at the side of the road. He took him to the inn. And this is what he told the innkeeper. You take care of him. I'm going to give you two pins. Now what's a pins? A day's wages. What's a day with the Lord? A thousand years. As a thousand years. And a thousand years. As one day. What's he telling us? The end in the Bible is the church. The innkeeper is the man of God that ministers and preaches. So he 
he's telling the innkeeper, you take care of this man because he is mine. But I'm going to give you two days wage. Or I'm going to give you 2,000 years wage. But if that doesn't cover it, when I come again, I'll repay, I'll pay you up in full. What's that tell us? Jesus is saying, one day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. In our time, Christ has been gone for over 2,000 years or two days. Amen. He gave enough for two days or 2,000 years. So we're living on borrowed time. Are you trying to set the time and the day when he, he might delay his coming for another 1,000 years? I don't know. But I do know this. He's already paid enough for, for 2,000 years or two days. So we're living over on borrowed time. And he could be If he comes today, where are you going to be found? Still trying to horse trade with him? <laughs> and a light shone round about him. And there was a great multitude. They were praising God. Glory to the highest. Peace over. Goodwill. God's will. 